All right. We are back. Cast. Origins of our discontents. And we're on pillar number four. Purity versus pollution. Ooh, and alliteration. I love that. Okay. The fourth pillar of cast. Oh, hold on, let me. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The fourth pillar of caste rests upon the fundamental belief in the purity of the dominant caste and the fear of pollution from the caste steamed beneath it. Over the centuries, the dominant caste has taken extreme measures to protect its sanctity from the perceived taint of the lower castes. <laughs> taint. <clears throat> Both India and the United States at the zenith of their respective caste systems and the short-lived but heinous regime of the Nazis raised the obsession with purity to a high, if absurd, absurdist, art. Oh, an art, I mean, valid. In some parts of India, the lowest caste people were to remain a certain number of paces from any dominant caste person while walking out in public, somewhere between 12 and 96 steps away, depending on the castes in question. Sheesh. They had to wear bells to alert those deemed above them so as not to pollute them with their presence. A person in the lowest subcaste in the Maratha region had to, quote, drag a thorny branch with him to wipe out his footprints and, pro and prostrate himself on the ground if a Brahmin passed so that his, quote, foul shadow might not defile the holy Brahmin, end quote. Oof. Touching or drawing near to anything that had been touched by an untouchable was considered polluting to the upper castes and required rituals of purification for the high caste person following this misfortune. Oof. This they might do by bathing at once in flowing water or performing pranayama breaths along with meditation to cleanse themselves of the pollutants. In Germany, the Nazis banned Jewish residents from stepping onto the beaches at the Jews' own summer homes, as at Wannsee, a resort suburb of Berlin, and at public schools in the Reich. Quote, they believed the entire pool would be polluted by immersion in it of a Jewish body, end quote. John Paul Sartre once observed. Sartre, I feel like there's, there's a fancy way to say that. In the United States, the subordinate caste was quarantined in every sphere of life. They made untouchable, uh, made untouchable on American terms for most of the country's history and well into the 20th century. In the South, where most people in the subordinate caste were long consigned, black children and white children studied from separate sets of textbooks. In Florida, the books for black children and white children could not even be stored together. African Americans were prohibited from using white water fountains and had to drink from horse troughs in the southern swelter before the era of separate fountains. In southern jails, the bed sheets for black gosh, the bed sheets for the black prisoners were kept separate from the bed sheets for the white prisoners. All private and public human activities were segregated from birth to death, from hospital wards to railroad platforms to ambulances, hearses, and cemeteries. In stores, black people were prohibited from trying on clothing, shoes, hats, or gloves, assuming they were permitted in the store at all. If a black person happened to die in a public hospital, quote, the body will be placed in a corner of the dead house, away from the white corpses, quote, end quote, wrote the historian Bertram Doyle in 1937. This pillar of caste was enshrined into law in the United States in 1896 after a New Orleans man challenged an 1890 Louisiana law that separated, quote, the white and colored races, quote, in railroad cars, in railroad cars. Louisiana had passed the law after the collapse of Reconstruction and the return to power of the former Confederates. A committee of concerned citizens of color came together and raised money to fight the law in court. On the appointed day, June 7, 1892, Homer A. Plessy, a shoemaker who looked white but was categorized as black under the American definition of race, bought a first class ticket from New Orleans to Covington on the East Louisiana Railroad and took his seat in the whites only car. 
in that era, a person of ambiguous racial origin was presumed not to be white, so the conductor ordered him to the colored car. Plessy refused and was arrested, as the committee had anticipated. His case went to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court, which ruled seven to one in favor of Louisiana's separate but equal law. It set in motion nearly seven decades of formal state-sanctioned isolation and exclusion of one caste from the other in the United States. In Southern courtrooms, even the word God was segregated. What? There were two separate Bibles, one for blacks and one for whites, to swear to tell the truth on. The same sacred object could not be touched by hands of different races. Ooh, this pillar of purity, as with the others, endangered the lives of the people in the subordinate caste. One day in the 1930s, a black railroad switchman was working in Memphis and slipped and fell beneath a switch engine. He lay bleeding to death, his right arm and leg severed. Quote, ambulances rushed to the man's aid, according to reports of the incident. They took one look, saw that he was a Negro, and backed away. And in a water break, Ooh. oh, which is perfect timing as our next section of this chapter is the sanctity of water. And I know this one is, I, rem I remember this one. <clears throat> the waters and, so the sanctity of water. The waters and shorelines of nature were forbidden to the subordinate caste if the dominant caste so desired. Well into the 20th century, African Americans were banned from white beaches and lakes and pools, both north and south, lest they pollute them, just as Dalits were forbidden from the waters of the Brahmins and Jews from Aryan waters in the Third Reich. This was a sacred principle in the United States well into the second half of the 20th century, and the dominant caste went to great lengths to enforce it. Well, sure they did. In the early 1950s, when Cincinnati agreed under pressure to allow black swimmers in some of its public pools, whites threw nails and broken glass into the water to keep them out. In the 1960s, a black civil rights activist tried to integrate a public school by swimming a lap and then emerging to towel off. Quote, the response was to drain the pool entirely, wrote the legal historian Mark S. Wiener and refill it with fresh water. And you know they're peeing in that pool too. They just, and they, just, oh gosh. Decades before, in 1919, a black boy paid with his life and set off a riot in Chicago for inadvertently breaching this pillar of caste. 17-year-old Eugene Williams was swimming in Lake Michigan at a public beach on the city's south side and happened to wade past the imaginary line that separated the races. He unknowingly passed into the white water, which flowed into and looked no different from the black water. He was stoned and drowned to death for doing so. The tensions over the breaching of boundaries that summer incited the dominant caste and set off one of the worst race riots in US history. It incited the dominant caste. Okay. In the decades after, <laughs> The middle American, oh, that's so we're the angry ones. In the decades after, in middle American places like Newton, Kansas, and Marion, Indiana, in Pittsburgh and St. Louis, people in the upper caste rose up in hysterics at the sight of a subordinate caste person approaching their water. In August 1931, a new public park opened in Pittsburgh with pools the size of a football field and big enough for 10,000 swimmers. But Soon afterward, as the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reported, quote, each Negro who entered the pool yesterday was immediately surrounded by whites and slugged or held beneath the water until he gave up his attempt to swim and left, end quote. In the summer of 1949, the city of St. Louis had what was considered the largest city pool in the country at its fairground park. When the city, under pressure from black citizens, took up the issue of allowing black people into the pool, the backlash was immediate. 
a man who happened to have the same name as the official in charge of in integrating the pool, required police protection due to the mistaken threats against him. Lifeguards considered quitting in protest. The day, the first, <laughs> they are so mad. Like they just mad. They can still go. No one is doing anything to them. They're just mad. Oh, yeah. okay. It sounds familiar, but I'm still like, no one said anything about you. <sighs> the day the first African Americans arrived to swim, a crowd gathered with knives, bricks, and bats. They set upon the black children who had come to swim, forcing them to walk a gauntlet, striking and taunting them. The mob grew to 5,000 people who chased after any black person they saw approaching the park. Children on bicycles, a man stepping off a streetcar, a truck stalled in traffic, a black man on a porch at a house next to the park. They kicked him as he lay on the ground, limp and bleeding. The town of Newton, Kansas, went to the state Supreme Court to keep black people out of the pool it built in 1935. The city and its contractor argued that black people could never be permitted in the pool, not on alternate days, not at separate hours, not ever, because of the type of pool it was. Ugh. They told the court, oh, I can't. They, <laughs> they told the court that it was a, quote, a circulatory type of pool in which the water is only changed once during the swimming season, end quote. White people, they argued, would not go into water that had touched black skin. Quote, the only way white residents would swim in a pool after blacks, wrote the historian Jeff Wiltz, was if the water was drained and the tank scrubbed. The operators couldn't do all that every time a black person went into the pool, so they banned black people altogether. The court sided with the city, and for decades more, the town's only public pool remained for the exclusive use of the dominant caste. Like, call the bluff and just be like, oh, well, figure it out. Go to the pool or don't. Like, oh, well, we have to, because some people will be mad about it. <sighs> anyway. Um, a public pool outside Pittsburgh solved this problem by keeping black people out until after the season was over in September, which meant it was closed to black swimmers at the precise time that they or anyone else would have wanted to use it. The manager said this was the only way the maintenance crew could, quote, could get, uh, quote, sufficient time to properly cleanse and disinfect it after the Negroes have used it, end quote. A white woman in Marion, Indiana, seemed to be speaking for many in the dominant caste across America when she said that they, that white people wouldn't swim in with colored people because they, quote, didn't want to be polluted by their blackness, end quote. Far from her, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, okay, whites blocked African Americans at the stairwells and entrances the week the city first allowed black swimmers to its public pool. There and elsewhere, quote, Every black swimmer that entered the water quite literally risked his or her life, Wilts wrote. It was in this atmosphere in 1951 that a little league baseball team in Youngstown, Ohio, won the city championship. The coaches, unthinkingly, decided to celebrate with a team picnic at a municipal pool. When the team arrived at the gate, the lifeguard stopped one of the little leaguers from entering. It was Al Bright, the only black player on the team. His parents had not been able to attend the picnic, and the coaches and some of the other parents tried to persuade the pool officials to let the little boy in to no avail. The only thing the lifeguards were willing to do was let them set a blanket for him outside the fence and to let people bring him food. He was given little choice and had to watch his teammates splash, teammates splash in the water and chase each other on the pool deck while he sat alone on the outside. Quote, from time to time, one or another of the players or adults came out and sat with him before returning to join the others. His childhood friend, the author Mel Watkins, would write years later. It took an hour or so for a team official to finally convince the lifeguards, quote, that they should at least allow the child into the pool for a few minutes, end quote. The supervisor agreed to let the little leaguer in but only if everyone else got out of the water and only if Al followed the rules they set for him. First, 
everyone, meaning his teammates, the parents, all the white people, had to get out of the water. Once everyone cleared out, quote, Al was led to the pool and placed in a small rubber raft. Watkins wrote, a lifeguard got into the water and pushed the raft with Al in it for a single turn around the pool as a hundred or so teammates, coaches, parents, and onlookers watched from the sidelines. After the, quote, agonizing few minutes that it took to complete the circle, Al was then escorted to his assigned spot on the other side of the fence. During his short time in the raft, as it glided on the surface, the lifeguard warned him over and over again of one important thing. Just don't touch the water, the lifeguard said, as he pushed the rubber float. Quote, whatever you do, don't touch the water. The lifeguard managed to keep the water pure that day, but a part of that little boy died that afternoon. When the coaches offered him a ride home, he declined. Quote, with champion trophy in hand, Watkins wrote, Al walked the mile or so back home by himself. He was never the same after that. Mm. I'm going to take a break of this one after that.